Greetings everyone, my name is Etterville, and I welcome you all to my let's play of A Valley Without Wind. It's a 2D procedurally generated side-scroller platformer slash shooter, developed and published by Arson Games. It was released two years ago and has received a few updates, but no full expansions. It was followed by a sequel a year, about a year later, though I prefer this game for several reasons, but we'll get into that later. Here on the title screen is basically the essential parts of the story of this game. It's the year 888 and reality has completely shattered. Wind blast snowfields are now on environment for centuries. And the citizens of the Ice Age have been reliant on magic-driven technology, and now the world's an alien place. The only people who can survive this world are the Glyph Bearers, aka player characters chosen by the Lari, who are very mysterious. And they're the ones who can save the world, basically. And as the world is shattered, now rea and the reality is shattered, the time, the time space is all over the place. But we'll get into that more and more detail. Anyways, time to create a world. For the for the first content, I'll be basically following the tutorial and going for default settings in terms of combat difficulty and platformer difficulty. In future com continents to come, I'll increase the difficulty in, the, in both of those regards, or three of them, uh, just to show how more difficult and frustrating the game can get. But at least you can adjust these at any time. It has also a city building difficulty, but I find it to be a little bit finicky at times. It was much more improved on in the sequel. But for now, default it works. Alright, now that we've gotten for two there, we have our selection from a set of four randomized characters. We can only choose from Ice Age characters right now, but we'll, we'll have an expanded choice later on. Uh, I keep randomizing the characters so I can find a person who has relatively good health and mana, as well as attack. Red indicates a bad trait, and green, the green indicates a superior trait. As such, I'm going with Faraday Hilsey, as she has a pretty good health and attack power, though her mana is relatively average. Anyways, here's the tutorial area. In this chest is the Fire Touch spell. It's a fire elemental spell which can destroy background objects as well as damage enemies. Though it's really close range, so please keep that in mind. In the beginning areas are these gravestones, which basically explain certain aspects of the game to new players. In fact, as a funny note, Arson Games actually placed these tombstones here as the playtesters and beta testers had some issues with some of the game mechanics, so they got stuck or died. So, pretty funny play over here. Over here is basically explaining that to, to destroy the craze to the right, you must use the Fire Touch spell gem. Or any spell gem that can destroy background objects. As you may have noticed, when I destroyed those trees in the background, that cherry tree uh, dropped a cherry. And over here is basically some minerals. You can destroy these uh, these trees and minerals uh, to get crafting uh, equipment or crafting items, which can be stockpiled up, and these are used for collecting gems, uh, creating enchants, as well as creating new spell gems. Fire Touch being one spell gem out of many. Now players would usually progress to the ride, but if you use the wooden platforms which you just collected, you can travel up here and get another item. Over here we could get an enchant. This enchant is the featherweight enchant. It can be equipped on the leg and prevents falling damage immunity as well as increases our mana by 20. The main beauty of this enchant is that it basically makes you immune from falling from high heights. Now the wooden platforms, they can be, and they basically can be placed anywhere on screen, though it's best to be placed on top of background objects as they'll stick to any part of the background. If it's not part of a the background, then it'll fall to the ground. Though, if it's placed over the acid water, it'll float up. So that, so that's pretty nice. 
And over here we're entering our first building, the Ice Age apartment. Over here the tutorial is basically saying there are three different uh, type, three different ones you should pay attention to. The green room, the cyan room types are basically the basic rooms. The grayed out ones, like this one, are destroyed rooms, which have nothing of use in them other than for switching enchants, or other or switching spell gems and other things. And the gold rooms gold or yellow ones are the ones where you can find the stockpiles of items. Basically, whenever you traverse to buildings, you always want to try going for those yellow aisle places, as just going through the uh, other rooms is just a waste of time in the long run. Really, it's just managing your time in the building so you can reach the gold stockpile rooms as quickly as possible, as this, those will have the bulk of your uh, crafting items. Now, the other rooms do have crafting items as well, but they're in much lower quantity, and less valuable. And also, please keep in mind that you, you can enter some of the rooms sideways, as well as there being alternate rooms to enter. Like here, for example. Whenever a room in the image on the bottom right actually shows a white bar in between it, that means that it has a side entrance to somewhere else. Like here. You can take That usually means there's a vent somewhere which you can take from one room to another. Like in this case, we can go to the hallway and go to the stash room. And sadly, Zeb, uh, shown in the grab tomb, wasn't able to get out. Right now, I'm just showing all the rooms just for posterity. As in the tutorial region, these buildings are basically constant. And what I just picked up there was the Storm Dash. The Storm Dash basically, once you double tap in a certain direction, You'll, you'll basically run there at a ha rapid speed, as long as you hold the button down, though it drains your mana at a certain rate. The interesting thing though, it doesn't really scale in terms of mana costs. So, what, what advantage is there, once you get to higher level continents and higher stronger levels, you basically become immortal. You can use it more indefinitely. I also collected an, a, a ball lightning spell, which is, is mandatory for passing this uh, monster. Here, if you pause, you can see the monster's weaknesses. In this case, the red slime is completely immune to fire, which means my, my fire touch spell gem would be completely useless. So you need to use a different elemental spell. In this case, the ball lightning, which is an air elemental. Also, the suggestions here say, state that you should always try sniping these enemies. These enemies are basically ice espers, so they'll, they're more weak to fire type attacks. Unfortunately, it's kind of risky to use the fire touch spell gem as it's really close range, so it's best to use the ball lightning and snipe at them. But ice espers are one of the easiest enemies to take care of. They and another element type, enemy type, are basically the Goombas of this game. And also another advantage of the ball lightning spell I didn't mention earlier is that it, it travels across the ground for a short while before moving towards before dissipating. So it, it runs across the ground, which makes it a bit easier to defeat enemies. Also, when you destroy enemies, they drop he health pickups, those green orbs, as well as those purple things being consciousness shards. Consciousness shards being essentially the consciousness of dead people and beings. They're essentially the main currency of this game. And here's the next Goomba of this game, the Skelebots. You will be seeing a lot of variations of them for, uh, throughout the game, but the two we saw, saw there were the Skelebot Soldiers and the Skelebot Snipers. The Skelebot Soldiers are pretty much dumb enemies which try running into you and meleeing you to death. While well, the Skullbot Snipers will try sniping you with fireballs. They tend to be weak against uh, air as well as water, I believe. Though you can double check that uh, by just pausing and uh, massing over. Once again, I'm going through all the rooms just to show off the tutorial area. In future parts, I'll be skipping out the rooms which don't have any. A sta which are not stash rooms. As over here, we see their mineral deposits, but really, they're not that useful. 
as this room is a, has a dash on it, it has a side entrance. Now, as we say here, the other room type that is important, the fourth one, are the red rooms. Those are where bosses are fought. As this is saying, this slime over here is completely immune to air and fire type attacks. It's 200% resistant against explode, so we need to find another spell type. Or a spell of a different type. In total, there are six spell gem types, but I'll be going through them in the next part. Right now, all we need to know is that we need a different spell. Over here, it's basically explaining the fact that it's not useful to explore all the rooms of a cave, or system, or building. Especially caves, because they can go on infinitely, so it's best to manage your time so that you get all the stash rooms and get out. And always, make sure to have a, a wooden platforms and wooden crates in excess, so you don't get trapped. Anyways, we need to backtrack a bit so we can get a spell jam so we can actually defeat that boss. And no, I can't skip this uh, cave section as we'll need that spell gem for later. Also, all water in this game is acidic, so please try avoiding uh, falling into it unless you, unless you get the acid gills enchant, which is necessary for certain segments of the game. Anyways, as this uh, gravestone is saying, basically snipe the skull boss from above so you don't get heavily damaged. This is especially crucial in harder difficulties, harder combat difficulties, because they fire much more rapidly. Also, you may notice that whenever I destroy any of these skelly bots, they have an X and ne X needed until next unlock. What that means is that. If you kill a certain enemy type enough times, they'll unlock harder, more, more harder, more difficult enemy types. And of course, they'll unlock new spell gems, areas, new people to recruit, etc. So it unlocks more features, but also makes the game more difficult. So keep that in mind. And over here, we get the Ice Cross spell, which is an ice elemental. This will allow us to get through those so that slime earlier. It basically fires a cross of ice out of your character. It cannot be aimed in any way as it's just entirely based off of the player's positioning. And of course, what it doesn't also uh, what it also says is that it can also destroy background objects. As shown here, it destroyed the slime. The, the fire touch spell gem and the ice cross can both destroy background objects, but the ball lightning cannot. It can only destroy objects in the foreground. This uh, this will be a, a common theme that with other spells. I also picked up an I forgot to mention, but I also picked up an enchant which emits lights. Otherwise, if I didn't actually equip that enchant, this entire cave system would be much much darker. Of course, there's a trade-off for that, as there'll be certain other enchants with better spells or effects. Now here's a crafting workbench, where you can craft new spell gems, if you have the, uh, enough crafting materials for it. Now, I have enough materials to create the Launch Rock 2 spell, ge uh, spell gem, which is an earth elemental projectile attack, but I'm looking forward to uh, getting another type of earth spell gem, so I decided against it. But it has its uses. And of course we can unlock more spell gem types, more than the ones listed there, if we follow certain unlock specifications. Which is usually based off of exploration and killing enemies. But really though, this game's main premise is based off of exploration. But I'll be getting to more of the objectives in the main game in the next part. Right now, it's basically a tutorial on understanding how the equipment works. Anyways, we're entering the boss room from the other side, instead of the side room. And we're getting back to the point we couldn't get through earlier. So yeah, we open it. And we have the first two bosses. The giant shadow bat, the two giant shadow bats. 
As always, pause to see what their weaknesses are. Though, with the limited number of spell gems I have right now, I'd rather just use the Ice Cross and Ball Lightning, as they aren't completely resistant to it. Now, if we defeat 14 more of those giant bats, we'll discover a harder version of them. So keep that in mind. And we're at the lowest most portion of the cave, which this instruction manual says states. Now let's just collect the spoils and warp out of here. We, These blue orbs here are basically warp gates. We saw these earlier back in the building we were in, but these allow you to warp uh, to any parts of the region uh, you experienced earlier. You don't need to actually enter the warp gate to use it, you just need to go to the region that the warp gate is in. The room that is. And you'll be able to use it, for, warp to it for another warp gate. Very useful, make sure to take advantage of it. In the early game, the several of these materials will be very useful, but in later, it's best to use your crafting notebook or tracking or tracker so you don't get excess materials which are useless. As there are a lot of spell gems, but not everyone is preferable for all situations. Plus, personal preferences in mind. Also, also, mana regenerates at a certain rate, but only certain characters have faster re mana regen rates or mana capacities. So, you have a high chance of running out if you overuse spells, especially those with high mana costs. Anyways, we'll warp back to the surface. Up, in the, up over there in the purple crystal is a neutral Ilari. The Ilari are basically the ones who were able to give the glyphs to the to the people allowing them to survive in this world. The glyph bearers being the, per the player characters. Now others can survive as well, but, but the glyph bearers have increased immunity to all sorts of damages, as well as the hostility to the world, as well as making the windstorms non-instant death traps, but we'll get into that more. And as it's saying here, Make sure to bring at least one spell gem of each element, so you don't get stuck with attacking enemies with their immunities. As they're shown in the t in the grave, because he, because he had only one element type, he got stuck and was perished. Anyways, here's the first official, well, second official boss. This giant skellybot. As stated in the gravestone, because someone took the lower path, she died. Now we have two options for, for this area. We can either skip the boss by taking the upper path, or we can fight the boss by taking the lower path. I'll be showing the upper path, and then going back to the lower path to defeat the boss. This segment is basically explaining that for, for a lot of rooms in this game, there are usually several pathways you can take to, just, uh, to avoid uh, the, fighting the bosses. You can skip fighting a lot of the bosses, except for the lieutenants and evil overlords, but we'll get into that. So, if you're not in the mood of fighting a boss, try avoiding it, especially in harder difficulties or if you're low on health. So, here's a Skelebot Giant, which is basically a combination of normal Skelebot soldiers and, ske and Skelebot snipers, so not too bad. Its weakness here is ice. And he's down. Not too bad. And to the right of us is the settlement. The settlement is basically where the Lari keep monsters at bay and where the fellow citizens and survivors live. These survivors are, are crucial for the evil overlord and lieutenant parts of the game, so make sure to keep them alive as well as keeping aware of their needs. I rushed through this section and collected a lot of enchants, and we'll explain what each does in the next part. But by going out of sight of the settlement, we're now on the world map. So yeah, here's the fractured world with all sorts of environments placed around each other with no rhyme or reason. Here the settlement is basically in the chilly snowfields. So yeah, we have four evil over uh, four lieutenants and an evil overlord to fight to free this continent of their evil rule and make this continent a better place. But yeah, there's the entire continent with all the lieutenants and overlords. Thankfully, they're actually on the continent itself. 
but we have a ways to go before actually freeing them, especially with our starting equipment. But anyways, thanks for watching viewers, and next part, I'll explain more about the spell gem enchanting, as well as the mechanics of the game in a more meta scale. Thanks for watching and have a nice day! Doodles!